Chapter 26, America and a World at War. After December 7, 1941 and the attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, America will find herself in the middle of a world at war. Europe has already been at war for years and is pretty much exhausted. Uh, Germany was dominating the West and Japan was unstoppable in the East. So by the time the United States actually gets into World War II, it's a pretty desperate time and we're going to have our hands full uh, trying to, to win this war. So we're going to talk about the course of the war once the United States joins the war effort. We'll talk about the effects of the war here at home in the United States. And then after the war is over, how do we go about trying to build or rebuild uh, the world after the greatest conflict the world has ever seen? And of course, remember, uh, people are very much afraid. We tried to do this after World War I, and it led directly into World War II. Um, and people are very much aware of this fact. How are we going to set the stage after World War II to prevent World War III? <laughs> And, of course, we haven't fought World War III yet, but still, they didn't do such a hot job because we'll, we'll talk about the next conflict that starts even before World War II is over. So, course of the war, the effects of the war at home, and building a post-war world. So, let's talk about the U.S. effort in World War II. By the time, as I mentioned, by the time the United States enters the war, her allies are on the brink of defeat. Uh, France had long since been defeated by Nazi Germany. Great Britain was ready to collapse after the, the months-long Battle of Britain where the German Air Force uh, pounded uh, England trying to get them to surrender. Uh, Germany is rolling through the Soviet Union. The Soviets can't stop the Germans and the Japanese are unstoppable in the Pacific. So when we enter into the war, we're, it's not like World War I where we came in on the tail end and we basically just had to help clean things up. No, uh, when we come into World War II, the question is not how do we best win this war, it's how do we prevent us from losing this war. So we're not, we're not, we're not worried about winning it, we're just worried about not losing it. So the, the first area that the United States is going to concentrate on will be in the Pacific Theater. And remember, it's, it's virtually two different wars. We have the war in the Pacific and we have the war in Europe. And the United States is going to be in the thick of both of these wars, but they're, they're pretty much unrelated. Even though Japan and Germany and Italy are our allies on paper, really it's two completely separate war efforts. So it's like the United States is fighting two wars at the same time. And the first one we're going to talk about is the Pacific. And as I mentioned, once they knocked out the American fleet at Pearl Harbor, there was no one left to stop the Japanese. And so the Japanese are going to roll through the Pacific really until uh, the, the latter half of 1942. And then there's going to be two incredibly important battles between the Japanese and the Americans, the Battle of Coral Sea and the Battle of Midway. And the Battle of Midway in particular will be the turning point in the Pacific theater for the United States. And really, it's kind of a lopsided victory. In the Battle of Midway, the United States had three carriers. Japan had six carriers. That being said, after the battle was over, the United States lost around 300 people and one carrier. The Japanese lost around 3,000 people uh, and four carriers of their Pacific fleet were destroyed. So the Battle of Midway, that was kind of the, the turning point in the Pacific theater. And that's what allowed the United States to adopt the strategy of island hopping. If you look, and I should have put a map up, but if you look at a map of the Pacific Rim, it's a series of small islands that are kind of clustered together. And so what would happen was the United States would land on an island, completely take it over, drive the Japanese off, and then use it as a springboard to launch attacks at the next one in line. And so the idea was they could kind of leapfrog their way up these island chains until eventually they would be ready to attack Japan itself. The problem with this is, and we'll talk more about this in just a minute, but the problem with this is it led to incredibly savage fighting. Places like uh, Guadalcanal, hand-to-hand, um, -hand jungle combat. Uh, the Japanese had fortified these islands with, with uh, fortresses and, and digging tunnels. Um, and, and so it was just a really, really nasty situation, which, which was compounded by the fact uh, in, in Japanese war culture, we'll, we'll talk about this, uh, admitting 
uh, defeat was a shame. So it was better to die in battle than it was to be captured as a prisoner. And so they would literally fight to the last man. Uh, so the island hopping strategy was successful and it will eventually uh, open uh, Japan up to invasion, but incredibly savage, bloody fighting along the way. All right, back over in Europe, the United States decided not to assault Europe directly. Uh, the, the USSR, the Soviet Union, was on the ropes. They needed the Americans to open up a second front to take some of that pressure off. Um, but the United States was not crazy about making a direct assault. So they decided to kind of go around the edges, kind of nibble in around the edges. They wanted to soften up Europe before they launched a direct attack. And so they actually didn't uh, start in Europe at all. They started in Africa. Uh, by 1942, uh, Nazi Germany and Italy controlled most of uh, Africa above the Sahara Desert. So that's where they decided to start. Uh, that's where Great Britain had really been concentrating a lot of their force. And it, it worked out. 1942-43 um, is going to kind of be the turning point in the Western Theater, excuse me, the Eastern Theater as well. Um, the Allies will take Africa back from uh, the Germans. And probably more important, Russia wins the Battle of Stalingrad. The Battle of Stalingrad was probably the bloodiest engagement of the entire war. The, the battle itself lasted for over six months. And what happened was, that, as we mentioned earlier, Germany invaded the Soviet Union in a surprise attack. They, they had this non-aggression pact, but everybody knew that this, this battle was coming sooner rather than later. Germany invades Russia in a surprise attack. Russia cannot stop them. And so Germany is just rolling through Russia um, and, in fact, almost, uh, almost captured Moscow. Well, they're finally stopped at the Battle of Stalingrad. Six months. Germany has 750,000 casualties. Russia has over a million casualties. And this just one battle. Germany has uh, three quarters of a million people killed or wounded. Russia has over a million killed or wounded. And that included 40,000 civilian casualties as well. But they finally stopped them. Um, and, and that's what allowed the United States to finally begin thinking about launching a direct attack into Europe. And they do in 1943. They come around through Sicily. Uh, Sicily, of course, is the large island just off the coast of Italy. So the idea was you use North Africa to launch an invasion into Sicily, and from there you can move into the rest of Europe. Well, it failed. Uh, the, the Germans counterattacked and uh, pushed the United States out for a little while. By this point, as we move into 1943-44, uh, the biggest advantage that the Allies had was their air superiority. By this point in time, the German Air Force was pretty much knocked out. And so the Allies could do whatever they wanted to in, in terms of through the air. And they used their air power to bomb. The idea was if you drop enough bombs, you destroy enough factories, you destroy enough military camps, eventually uh, it, it's going to soften up for a ground invasion. That was the idea. Obviously airplanes, you, you can't take land, you can't hold land, but you can use it uh, strategically, strategic bombing, to open up the way for your ground forces. So for example, Dresden. Dresden is a city in Germany. And you can see here, it was just reduced to rubble by the air power of the Allies. 135,000 people died in the bombing of Dresden. So just um, incredible destruction, incredible destructive power uh, that these new air forces held. This is the first, um, first war that air power was really a factor. And so this bombing helps pave the way for so-called D-Day, June 6, 1944, and the Allies landed at Normandy. And again, fierce resistance put up by the Germans, just like at Sicily, but this time the invasion sticks, and the Allies are able to, to push them off the beachhead. By mid-September, the Allies had driven the Axis almost entirely from France, and Germany is it's looking kind of bad for Germany. But they have one last trick that they're going to try, 
uh, the so-called Battle of the Bulge. And you can see here, this is the plan of the Battle of the Bulge. The blue line represents the, the Allies front line. So that was as far as they advances. The red lines represent the movement of the Germans. And you can see here the objective of the Battle of the Bulge was to capture Antwerp. Antwerp is a city in Belgium, heavily industrialized. And Germany thought if they could recapture Antwerp and, and those factories, they would be able to sustain their war effort for a little bit longer. So the idea was to launch a surprise attack sweep up, capture Antwerp, and that would give them the resources necessary to go on. You can see the, the dotted lines, that was their objectives. But then you can see the solid red line uh, was what actually happened. It did create a bulge. They did push uh, the Allies back. It came as a complete surprise. This was a heavily forested area, and the Allies didn't think that the Germans would be able to move tanks through this area, so they weren't ex uh, expecting a, an attack through it. Well, the Germans did, uh, caught the Allies flat-footed, and did manage to push in the lines, or out the lines, depending from your perspective, uh, and it did create a bulge. That's why it's known as the Battle of the Bulge. But the Allies recovered. They managed to push the uh, Germans back, and by that point, it was all pretty much over and done with. Um, May 8, 1945, VE Day, Victory in Europe. Victory in Europe. Um, the United States was pushing from the west, the Soviets were pushing from the east, and eventually they just sort of met in the middle. Something important to take note of, the Soviets are going to actually capture Berlin. Um, the Allies, the, the United States, I should say, the United States probably could have pushed harder and gotten to Berlin first. But we kind of held back and allowed the Soviets to do that. That's going to be important later on because the, the Soviet capture of Berlin is going to set the stage for a pretty big event just a few years down the road. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. The United States could have captured Berlin, but we allowed the Soviets to go ahead and take it. So by May 1945, uh, Nazi Germany is over and done with and we've won the European theater of, of World War II. Of course, Adolf Hitler uh, does not stand trial for his crimes. Uh, before Germany surrendered, he's actually going to commit suicide. So, okay. So, victory in Europe, but the United States is still at war in the Pacific. And again, incredibly bloody fighting as we uh, adopt this strategy of, of island hopping. Uh, Japanese forces... Uh, they, they simply refused to give up. And again, it, part of it was a cultural thing. Uh, there, there was deep shame in being taken prisoner, and so it was better to, to die gloriously in battle than it was to be defeated and taken prisoner. Um, so incredibly bloody, savage fighting. But the, the Allies, it, it was mostly the United States. Great Britain, um, and to the extent of what they could, France had agreed to support our efforts in the Pacific once they could. But by and large, this was a United States only battle. By 1944, America was, uh, was poised to invade Japan herself. And we're very worried about this. Um, because by this point, the Japanese have almost no planes, no ships. Uh, the, their army has been decimated. We have firebombed Tokyo, killing 80,000 people. Um, but they are on the ropes. There's no way they can win this war, and they still refuse to surrender. And so the American leaders are looking at this situation and thinking, if we have to invade Japan itself, we won't just be fighting the army. We will be fighting every man, woman, and child that lives on these islands. And it, the the... the the fighting has been incredibly bloody so far, but it's going to be nothing compared to if we have to invade Japan itself. Well, it, it could be in the millions of people killed or wounded if we're forced to invade. And so they're looking for another way out. They're, they're trying to find some other alternative, some other, um, some other method of convincing the Japanese that they've lost this war and they, they should surrender. And of course, we're talking about the atomic bomb. Uh, we'll talk about the politics here in just a, a few minutes, but by this point, uh, FDR has died in office, and so his vice president, Harry S. Truman, has taken over as president. 
Uh, and one of the first things that he's briefed on uh, once he becomes president is the existence of the atomic bomb. This is something we've been researching for years and we think we finally got one that will work. And so here's Truman and he's he's got a choice to make, right? He can either invade Japan facing maybe millions of casualties or he can use this atomic bomb and see what happens. And of course we all know what happens. Uh, the decision was made to drop the atomic bomb uh, first at Hiroshima, 80,000 people died. Initial, that's the initial numbers it said. Hiroshima, 80,000 people uh, died. Nagasaki, 100,000 people died just a, a couple of days later, three days later. And so the question is, did Truman really have to drop the bomb? Truman's argument was that yes, in order to prevent millions of casualties, both American and Japanese casualties, in order to prevent those casualties, it was better to drop the bomb than it was to invade Japan. And was that true? It might very well have been true. Um, nobody knows what would have happened if we had been forced to invade Japan. Uh, that being said, uh, just incredible devastation. And I said those were the initial numbers of people who died in the atomic and the actual atomic blasts. Um, but but for years the after effects have been felt. Cancer rates went through the roof. Birth defects. Uh, the the number of people who didn't die but they uh, they they lost limbs or you know they were wounded in some way. They were burned uh, severely burned. Um, just after the only times that atomic bombs have been used in anger have been used against humanity, and, and hopefully it will be the hopefully it will be the only time. Uh, Truman had a very difficult choice, and who knows whether it was the, the right one or not. Um, this is an aerial reconnaissance photo of, I believe this is Hiroshima. Um, this is prior to the atomic bomb, and this is after the atomic bomb. So you can see just absolute devastation, ju just complete destruction uh, on an enormous scale. The other controversial thing about the atomic bomb, and I don't know if there's any truth to this or not, but uh, there have been some historians who have theorized that this the use of the atomic bomb was not only an action against the Japanese, it was actually an action against the Soviets as well. And we'll talk about our issues with the Soviets here in just a moment. But a lot of people think that Truman was... Uh, kind of using this as a preview to the Soviets. We already knew that we were going to have problems with the Soviet Union. And so Truman used the atomic bomb to show the Soviets, hey, this could happen to you as well. This is the firepower that the United States has available. And so that, that's another controversial aspect of the atomic bomb, but it worked. Um, Japan agreed to unconditional surrender, and World War II was over, and there was much rejoicing. One thing we haven't mentioned yet that we need to at least touch on, we're not going to go deep into it because um, it really didn't affect the United States all that much, and this of course is an American history class, but one of the most defining characteristics of World War II was the Holocaust, um, or as it's known in the, the Jewish community, the Shoah. Numbers on the Holocaust, uh, we don't know how many people died. We simply don't know. Uh, I've seen numbers as low as a few, maybe two to three million, all the way up to somewhere six to eight. I, I've even some places put it as high as 10 million people. We, you know, the, the bottom line is that millions of people died. Uh, the, the, you know, it was a, um, it was a cold, calculated effort to kill as many people uh, as efficiently as possible. And, and we spoke about. Uh, Adolf Hitler's racial views in the last chapter, how he believed the Germans were the master race and he needed to purify the German blood and unite everyone under the, the German banner. Um, what I really want you to know about the Holocaust is that it was not an overnight event. The, the Holocaust was a very long, gradual process of discrimination that, that spanned several years, okay? It wasn't like Hitler 
and the rest of the Nazis just woke up one day and decided to begin mass murdering people of Jewish descent. Now, this is something that had been going on in a very gradual process uh, for years and years and years. And it started with very restrictive laws, right? Uh, Jewish people can no longer live in certain neighborhoods. Jewish people can no longer live uh, or attend certain schools. Uh, and then it was uh, Jewish people can no longer have certain types of jobs. Uh, and then it got to the point where uh, you have to wear distinctive clothing, right? That you have to wear a yellow star of David on your clothes if you're outside. And then Jewish people were rounded up and placed into certain neighborhoods. Uh, the Jewish ghettos placed into certain neighborhoods in these cities. And then eventually they were shipped out of these cities into uh, concentration camps. And then eventually they were moved into the so-called death camps. And again, this is a very, very long process. Hitler's, as he called it, the final solution, where he began uh, the, the death camps, such as Auschwitz. Um, he didn't actually begin construction and operation of these camps until 1942. By 1942, you know, the war is well half over. Um, and, and so uh, I, I want you... To, and it's hard to imagine, you know, looking back on World War II, because this was not something that was undertaken by just a, a few crazy people. It wasn't just Hitler, uh, who was some kind of psychopath who did this all by himself. It, truly, the entire German nation, if, they, if not everyone participated in it, everyone knew about it, at least the gradual process of discrimination. Maybe they didn't know about the death camps. Okay, fine. But they knew the way the Jewish people had been treated in their country for years and years and years. And so it's you, that's something that you have to realize, that it, it creeps in gradually over time. I, I think if they tried to do it overnight, obviously I think some people would have protested. Um, but in a long, gradual process, it, it made it easier for people to accept. Um, the other thing I want you, well, two other things I want you to realize uh, about the Holocaust. A lot of people have asked, well, why didn't the Jewish people just leave Germany? Um, if this was a long, gradual process, why didn't they just get up and move? If, if they could see what was coming, why didn't they try to escape? And they did. Uh, believe me, they did. If you had the, the means at all, if you had the resources to get out of the country, that's what you absolutely tried to do. But where would they have ran? You know, if they if they had left for France, that that was defeated just a few weeks into the war, if they had left for Poland or some other place in anywhere in Europe outside of maybe uh, the United Kingdom, they eventually would have been caught by the Germans. And the other problem was they wanted to leave, but nobody was willing to take them. Uh, and in fact, the United States, and I'm trying to remember the name of the conference now, and I, I it slipped my mind. The United States hosts an international conference before the war breaks out. Um, because everybody knew this was happening, this was no secret. The United States hosts an international conference saying, what can we help to, what can we do to help the Jewish people and the discrimination they're facing in Germany? And one of the suggestions put forth was, well, let them come to the United States. Give them visas to come to the United States. And we said no. Um, virtually every other country in the world, they might have opened up a, a few more slots, um, but not the overwhelming need that the Jewish people needed to get out of Germany. We said no. The other thing that I want you to realize is that it was not just Jewish people who were targeted. Um, that, that was probably the, the bulk and the, the most visible, um, but people such as the Roma, um, also known as gypsies, uh, people who were handicapped either physically or mentally, uh, homosexuals, people of Slavic descent, uh, these were all targets of the Nazis as well. And again, it was all an effort to quote-unquote purify their race. Okay, let's talk about the effects of World War II here in the United States. Uh, the war has the most impact on the economy because finally the Great Depression is over. Uh, the United States government is pumping such huge amounts of money into the economy that is what finally gets rid of the Great Depression once and for all. World War II, probably more than any other war in history, was a production war. Um, 
the victory hinged on who could turn out the most stuff. And really, that is the United States' greatest strength. Uh, we didn't have the best tanks. We didn't have the best guns or the best airplanes. Uh, in fact, what we'll mention in just a second, we had to play, you know, catch up in terms of technology. German tanks were better. Japanese had the best airplanes. Um, but the fact is, we could build more stuff than anyone else. And that's what won the war for the United States. Um, and again, like World War I, uh, business and government have a very, very close relationship. We go from widespread unemployment to actually a labor shortage in the United States. Because think about it, the same time that we're ramping up our factories to turn out you know, tanks and planes and guns, is the same time that we're sending men overseas to fight this war. So not only do men go back to work, but also the elderly, the young uh, women, minorities, they go back to work as well. Uh, just like World War One, the government wants to protect production and uh, makes unions pledge not to strike and in return uh, the United States government will protect unions. Uh, unions are huge during World War II. A full third of industrial workers belonged to a union. That is the highest proportion ever uh, in United States history. Um, we have a new fear. The old fear was deflation, uh, that there wasn't enough money to go around. The new fear is inflation. Inflation is what happens when your economy is running too hot. Uh, inflation means there's too much money in the economy, and so it buys less. It's supply and demand. Um, it, it's like, you know, uh, when you were a kid and could buy a, a can of Coke from a vending machine for 50 cents or whatever, and now it costs 75 cents or a dollar. That's inflation. Uh, when your you know, great-grandparents bought a car for a couple thousand dollars, and now you pay twenty to thirty thousand dollars. That's inflation. Money doesn't buy as much as it used to because there's too much of it. And once there's too much of it in the economy, it begins to lose its value because the more there is of something, the, the less it's worth. And so the old fear was deflation. And now that we've pumped so much money into the economy, the new fear is inflation. So the government attempts to control this with what's known as the OPA, the Office of Price Administration. Um, which uh, allowed the government to go in and fix prices, wages, and rations. That was the other thing, uh, the, the home front during World War II. You not only had to have the cash to pay for something, let's say you needed, uh, you needed gas for your car, not only did you need the, the cash money, you also had to have your little stamp book, your ration book, because things like gas and metal and plastic, uh, those things had to go towards the war effort first. And so their use among consumers was extremely limited. So uh, rationing was a big part of World War II. Uh, and the federal budget is going to grow enormously. Uh, the national debt is going to grow um, five times over. It, it increases uh, five times, uh, paid for by bonds and loans and higher taxes. Uh, the War Production Board was supposed to be similar to the old War Industries Board we spoke about in World War I. It was supposed to be a planned economy where you used to make consumer vehicles, now you make tanks. You used to make clothing, now you make soldiers' uniforms, something along those lines. Not nearly as efficient as World War I, but the economy is booming so much, nobody really cares. Uh, the economy is incredibly successful and it completely rebounds from the depths of the Great Depression. At first, as I mentioned, uh, the United States does have to play technology catch up, but eventually we do catch up and even surpass because by the end of the war, we are the only atomic nation. We're the only nation with the atomic bomb. Um, impact on the West Coast and the South. Uh, most of these may, uh, big defense firms, the ones that are producing the, 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 the planes and the tanks, they're located out west. Um, and of course, as always, the South always feels the effects more because we're more behind to begin with. And this is really kind of a turning point for the South where we see a lot of places like, um, like places in Alabama. Uh, it begins to shift towards more industrial work from agricultural work. Okay. 
Now, something that's interesting about World War II, I, I think as I mentioned before, it was very easy to tell the good guys from the bad guys in World War II. Uh, World War II really unites the American population, and wars don't always do that. Wars, in fact, are usually pretty divisive, right? I remember we, we spoke about World War I. Not everyone felt that going to war was the right thing. You look at the American experiences in Vietnam and Afghanistan and Iraq, and wars are not always unifying events. In fact, wars are usually divisive events. But World War II, um, after the, the um, attack on Pearl Harbor, um, it, it's very easy for the United States to come together in this, uh, th this patriotic display of what well, we're going to get through this. We mentioned the... Um, yeah, uh, the, the four freedoms that we're fighting for, freedom from fear, freedom of speech and religion, freedom from want, um, very similar to the Atlantic Charter. Uh, in the United States, to a lesser degree than we had to in World War I, but we still have to sell this war to the public. Um, the, the government controls information about the war through the Office of War Information, uh, you know, they're, they're trying to paint the United States in the best light, that we're fighting this war. Not, And again, it's the same thing with World War I, right? We're not fighting this war to make money. We're not fighting this war to gain land. We're fighting this war for these you know, more noble truths, the, these more noble ideals, um, the, these freedom values, right? Um, Japan, uh, Japan, excuse me, business is, is quick to jump on this bandwagon. Uh, they like to talk about the fifth freedom of uh, free enterprise. And again, that was America's ace in the hole. That's why we were so successful in this war effort is because big business was there to, uh, to produce the tanks and planes and guns that we needed to fight this war. World War II will also be seen as a opportunity uh, for minorities, especially for African Americans. Um, FDR creates the Fair Employment Practices Commission, um, which is designed to end discrimination in the workplace. Now, it's limited. Um, it, it has limited effects, but at least a symbolic move. It's at least a symbolic move. Uh, black people do serve in the armed forces, and again, they're, they're relegated to the, the lowest, most menial job. But as the war goes on and the need for manpower becomes greater, uh, black people will... Uh, be given more rights, will earn more rights as they serve in the armed forces. But um, it, it's not a perfect situation, right? You know, it, it may be two steps forward, but one step back. Because after the war is over, uh, a lot of these gains are going to be erased. And we will see you know, the birth of the modern civil rights movement come in on the tail end of World War II. So obviously, uh, yes, African Americans do gain a lot during the war, but, but it's not enough. Uh, Native Americans uh, has mixed results. The, the famous code talkers uh, of World War II do help the war effort. But again, Native American reservations uh, today, as well as back then, are among the poorest places in the United States. Um, more opportunities did exist for uh, people of Hispanic descent. Women, of course, uh, famously during World War II, probably the best example here, the, this Rosie the Riveter, uh, poster. Large numbers of women join the workforce, but there are obstacles. Uh, they do still face job discrimination. They do face pay discrimination. And World War II is actually going to cause uh, quite a few social problems uh, back here in the United States. Uh, for example, uh, marriage rates fall. Uh, birth rates fall. You know, it's very uncertain times. Nobody knows what's going to happen. They, they put off getting married. They put off having kids. Um, divorce rates begin to rise. Um, juvenile delinquency rates begin to rise. If mom's at work and dad's serving in the army somewhere, who's, who's watching the kids? Uh, and so we do see, uh, you know, teenage crime begin to rise in the United States. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, back in World War I, uh, people really viewed anything of German descent or anything connected with Germany with a very suspicious eye. And we don't really see that in World War II. 
uh, people don't really, you know, uh, you know, the, the outlaw, uh, you know, the, the teaching of the German language in high schools is not outlawed in World War II as it was in World War I. Uh, so we don't see that return uh, to hostility towards things of, of German descent, but we do see uh, the Japanese become targeted. And this is really one of the, the dark periods of American history. Um, the, Japan, the idea was that the fear that the government had was that Japanese families were so tight-knit, were, were so closely bound together, they were afraid that people of Japanese descent in the United States, even if they were American citizens, they were afraid that people of Japanese descent would spy uh, on the United States and report back to their family members in Japan. And so that they rounded up thousands of people of Japanese descent and forced them into internment camps. Now, please don't get me wrong, you know, th these are not the concentration camps uh, that Germany ran um, in Europe, but still, it, it's not summer camp either, right? Uh, Japanese people are stripped of their property, they're stripped of their freedom, they're not given a trial, even though they're American citizens and you have a right to a trial by jury, that they're not given their, a chance to defend themselves. They're just essentially arbitrarily thrown in jail and they're forced to remain there throughout the course of the entire war. Uh, as you can see here by these posters, uh, the, the use of racial propaganda uh, to further the war effort. And these aren't, these aren't outliers, right? The, these pawn, you can see here, uh, the posters are sponsored by Texaco and the Douglas Aircraft Company and by the United States Army, okay? So these aren't, you know, things on the fringe of society. These are major American companies and institutions. So the use of this propaganda is just really kind of, uh, it's, it's horrible. It's incredibly horrible. Um, but this point, uh, the, the New Dealers have mostly been voted out of office. Um, and Congress, this more conservative Congress, is going to use World War II as an excuse to dismantle as much of the New Deal as they possibly can. And FDR allows this to happen. Number one is because it served its purpose. Uh, the New Deal was designed to combat the Great, De uh, Great Depression, and the Great Depression is over, so we don't have to worry about it anymore. Now, obviously, some things such as Social Security will, will stand the test of time. Uh, but by and large, FDR is going to give up on the New Deal in order to win a historic fourth term, even though by this point, everyone knows that he's not good. He is gravely ill. He's nearing the end of his life. And, of course, he will not finish out this fourth term. He's elected to a fourth term. Uh, he dies, and his... President, excuse me, Vice President Harry S. Truman is going to take over. All right, let's talk about these efforts to build a post-war world. Even before the war ended, it became clear the United States and the Soviet Union were going to have problems with each other. And it's due to a fundamental difference in ideology. The United States was pushing for an abandonment of military alliances and a more democratic process with something like the League of Nations, this international organization kind of serving as the mediator between countries with disputes. The Soviet Union, and to a, a lesser degree, even our allies like France and the, the British, uh, they, they're not crazy about this idea. They would rather have this old European balance of power that had existed since the, the Treaty of Westphalia back in the 1800s, right? Um, they, they want a system where great powers have control of areas of strategic interest. They're not crazy about this democratic process the United States keeps harping about. Um, so we're coming at it, and of course the United States believes in capitalism, the Soviet Union is a communist country, which we have a deep and unabiding fear and suspicion of. So, you know, it, it's obvious we're going to have tensions uh, before the war is even over. In 1943, the so-called Big Three meet for the first time. Uh, the Big Three are the wartime leaders of the Soviet Union, the United States, and the United Kingdom. You see them pictured here. Uh, left to right, that's Joseph Stalin of the Soviet Union, FDR of the United States, and Winston Churchill 
of the United Kingdom. So 1943, they meet for the first time in Tehran. Um, nothing really is accomplished here. FDR promises to eventually invade Europe, which of course we do. Uh, they, there is some discussion over Poland. Uh, the Soviet Union, remember at the outset of the war, uh, Germany invaded from the west, the Soviet Union invaded from the east. Well, the Soviet Union wants to keep some of that land, and we're not crazy about that, uh, but we do, we are willing to talk about it. In 1945, they meet again at Yalta. The big thing that I want you to know about Yalta is that this is where the plans for the United Nations is drawn up. Uh, the United Nations is the spiritual successor to the League of Nations. It's this international organization designed to keep the peace. The big difference is, is that the United States will become a leading member of the United Nations. We never join the League, but we are a major member of the United Nations. As a matter of fact, its headquarters is in New York City. So, um, at Yalta, we draw up plans for the United Nations. Uh, the, the most important body within the United Nations is the Security Council, and there will be five permanent members of the Security Council. The rest of the seats are going to rotate among the member countries, but there are five countries that will always have a seat, and those are the United States, Great Britain, France, Soviet Union, and China, essentially the winners of World War II. Now, the big thing about the Security Council is, is that each one of these countries has veto power. That means that each one of these countries has the authority to shut anything within the United Nations down. It doesn't matter if the vote is 300 to 1. If the United States says we don't want to do this, they can veto it. If the Soviet Union says we don't want to do this, they can veto it. So you can see um, it's kind of setting the stage between the, the Soviets and the United States um, for years to come. Well. At Yalta, it becomes obvious that the Soviet Union is trying to spread its influence as much as possible. As it moved through Eastern Europe, remember the United States is pushing from the West, the Soviets are pushing from the East, and we're trying to meet up in Berlin, uh, or at least Germany. As the, 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 as the Red Army, as the Soviet Union is moving through Eastern Europe, it's leaving behind little pockets of its army to influence these countries uh, to, to maybe join their side. They want to split up Germany. Um, and, and of course, you can understand their feeling. Uh, Germany was blamed for World War I. Germany was definitely responsible for World War II. And, and they don't want to run the risk of Germany starting World War III. So they want to dismantle Germany. They want to split it up. And the United States is not crazy about this. We, we had rather see a unified Germany. But Anyway, the, uh, the eventual decision, and we'll talk about this in the next couple of chapters, uh, Germany will be split up. Okay. The last meeting of note that I want you to know about is in 1945 at Potsdam. Now, this is a pretty big meeting. This is a pretty big deal. First of all, you need to know that the uh, representation has changed. You can see here on the far right, Joseph Stalin is still in command of the Soviet Union, but uh, FDR has died in office, and so the middle figure is Harry S. Truman. That's the new American president, and Winston Churchill was actually voted out of office, and he's been replaced by the man on the far left, Clement Attlee of the United Kingdom. And Truman goes into this saying, I'm going to get tough. You know, the, the Soviets are, are spreading their influence through Eastern Europe. The, the Soviets are talking about wanting to split up Germany, the Soviets are keeping their land in Poland, and I'm not going to stand for it. Unfortunately for Truman, he's kind of the new kid on the block, and he doesn't have the power or the leverage uh, to really tell Stalin what to do, and so he's pretty much forced to, to back down. Um, and he really doesn't get a whole lot accomplished at Potsdam. Uh, you do need to know that Bretton Woods was a financial conference that created the World Bank and the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. Um, and all you really need to know about that today is that both the World Bank and the IMF pretty much exist today uh, with helping developing countries kind of get their footing. Okay, fine. The last thing I want you to be aware of was what was going on in China. 
China was our biggest Asian wartime ally, and we would love to see a strong, independent China continue to be our friend as we move forward through uh, the, the years after World War I. Uh, excuse me, too. The only problem is, is that China is in the middle of a civil war. Uh, the Chinese government of World War II was ran by a man named Chiang Kai-shek. He was America's friend, but unfortunately he was also corrupt. Uh, he's also a, a pretty weak leader, and he's facing um, he's facing a, a revolution essentially from the communist forces of Mao Zedong. And so, even before World War II is really over, China is going to be engulfed in this civil war between Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong. Now, the United States, we are willing to support Chiang Kai-shek as much as we can, but we are not going to send troops in. Uh, on his behalf, you know, in, in the middle of this war, we just got finished fighting World War II, we're tired of war. And, and so as China kind of devolves into civil war and chaos and destruction, which eventually uh, Mao Zedong, the communist leader, will win, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, um, we're looking, we've realized that China is not going to be the big ally that we were hoping for, and so we're looking for another ally in Asia. Uh, maybe to help us against the Soviet Union, and we decide on Japan. Now, this is kind of interesting because just a few short months, just a, a few years before, Japan was our most bitter enemy. But we go into Japan, we completely reinvent society, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, they, they westernize even more than they had, uh, and they, they bounce back in an incredible fashion. Uh, they were devastated by World War II, and yet by the time we hit the 60s and 70s, moving into the 80s, uh, Japan is an international powerhouse, and they do. They become one of our strongest allies ever, so it's kind of interesting. We go from bitterest enemies uh, to one of the, the strongest relationships that the United States has. But, but it is clear, um, as we move into the years after World War II, uh, the world is still going to have problems. And, and even though we did manage to, to quote-unquote, save the world, that we defeated Nazi Germany and imperialist Japan, and that's wonderful, um, that did not solve the problems. And we are shaping up for an even larger conflict, maybe not in terms of death and destruction, but definitely in terms of money spent. Uh, we are shaping up for an even larger conflict with the Soviet Union, uh, but that will come later.